action. Tonight, we're excited to have one of our own Montgomery Amateur Radio Club members, John K3LO, with this very interesting presentation entitled Australia and Antarctica on QRP. And please hold your questions till the end of the presentation. So John, thank you for joining us and over to you. Oh, thank you, Alex. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm John K3LO. This evening, I'm going to tell you about two memorable QSOs that I made. This will take about 40 minutes. Um, just to avoid any bandwidth problems, I'm going to stop my video. And I'm going to share my application with you. So this is my uh, first station in 1971. My first rig was a Heathkit HW-16. And this is a better picture of the HW-16. It was CW only. It had a very good receiver. It had a crystal control transmitter, which put out about 65 watts. This is my station in 1997. And this is my station today. From left to right, that's an Astron SS10 switching power supply, an MFJ407 electronic keyer. This is my Tentec Argosy. I bought this in 1981 from Barry Electronics in New York City. The receiver is a single conversion superheterodyne. The transmitter puts out 50 watts on CW or single sideband. It's all solid state, so I don't have to peak the grid and dip the plate every time I change frequency. My keyer is a Vibroplex iambic standard upgraded. My straight key is a Nye Viking Speedex that I bought in uh, 1979. And I bought the table in 1978. Let's look under the top cover of the Argosy. This is an eight pole crystal filter with a 1.8 kilohertz bandwidth. This is a six pole crystal filter with a 250 hertz bandwidth. Now let's look under the bottom cover. This circuit board that says CW filter, it's a two stage active audio filter with a 150 hertz bandwidth. The rig is 40 years old, but it has a very good receiver and it doesn't have any latency. This is my Dentron model AT1K antenna tuner. I bought this at Barry Electronics in New York City in 1981 at the same time I bought the Argosy. It's a typical T network antenna tuner. Amateur radio is a multifaceted hobby. Like a lot of things in life, if you find your niche, you can be very happy. I received my novice license in February, 1971. I could only work CW. I enjoyed CW very much and I stayed with CW. Around 1988, I became very interested in stealth antennas. I was living in a single family detached house, trees on the lot, no homeowners association, no deed restrictions, underground utilities, but I was very interested in stealth antennas. I bought a Barker and Williamson model AS20 trap dipole from EGE Electronics in Woodbridge, Virginia which is now ham radio outlet. It covers the 20, 15 and 10 meter bands. It was 23 feet long. I installed it in my attic. After I adjusted it, it covered the CW portions of 20, 15 and 10 meters with a standing wave ratio of 1.2 to one or less. My Dentron antenna tuner could easily get a one to one standing wave ratio anywhere in those bands. This is the ballon. The ballon was rated for one kilowatt. This is the 10 meter trap. This is the 15 meter trap. 
the traps were rated for one kilowatt. This is the end insulator. The antenna was advertised as covering the 20, 15, and 10 meter bands. In addition, my Dentron antenna tuner could get a one-to-one -one standing wave ratio on 40 meters. <clears throat> on 40 meters, which is 7,000 kilohertz, this antenna has an impedance of 20 ohms resistance minus 800 ohms capacitive reactance. That's an SWR standing wave ratio of 16 to one. If you're gonna try this, there are some things you need to know. When using an external antenna tuner to match an antenna system to a transmitter, tune the antenna tuner for minimum standing wave ratio as measured at the transmitter. That's because the standing wave ratio varies depending on where you measure it. The maximum power rating of amateur antenna system components is usually for a one-to-one -one standing wave ratio measured at the antenna. If you have a standing wave ratio higher than one-to-one, -one, you have to derate the maximum power rating. If I had tried using this antenna with a 16 to one SWR while running 200 watts, I would have been asking for trouble, but 50 watts was okay. The maximum power rating of amateur equipment is usually for CW and single sideband. CW has a 40% duty cycle. Single sideband with moderate speech processing has a 40% duty cycle. Digital modes and FM have a 100% duty cycle. So if you're using a digital mode or FM, you have to derate the maximum power rating even further. With my particular setup with very low loss coax with a standing wave ratio of 16 to one, 20% of the power from the transmitter was being radiated and the other 80% was heating the coax, the ballon and the traps. Even a very inefficient antenna will make QSOs when conditions are good. Conditions were good, I was making QSOs and I didn't care. Around 1998, I became very interested in QRP. QRP is generally defined as five watts or less of output power. This was during a very good solar cycle, cycle 23, which had a very broad peak, 1999, 2000, 2001. I built a wilderness radio SST20. It covered seven kilohertz at the upper end of the CW portion of the 20 meter band, which is where the QRP calling frequency is located. It had an output of two watts. I built a 10 tech model 1320 20 meter CW QRP kit. This radio covered the entire CW portion of the 20 meter band with an output of four watts. This radio has a starring role in the second part of this evening's presentation. I also built 10 tech model 1340 40 meter QRP kit. This radio covered the entire CW portion of the 40 meter band with an output of four watts. I had a lot of fun with these rigs. I worked stations in the United States, Canada, Mexico, Europe, the Caribbean and South America. This was during a very good solar cycle with a very broad peak. In 2015, I decided I wanted to work Australia on QRP. If I had decided to do that in 1999, 2000 or 2001, I could have worked Australia on QRP very easily 
on 15 meters or 10 meters. But now I was on the downside of a very disappointing solar cycle. The action was no longer on 20, 15 and 10 meters. Now the action was on 40 meters. That 40 meter antenna, which was dissipating 80% of the power as heat wasn't good enough anymore. I was still living in a single family detached house, trees on the lot, no homeowners association, no deed restrictions, underground utilities. I could have put up a 40 meter dipole in the trees, but I was still obsessed with stealth antennas. I started upgrading my antenna system. I began to construct a new trap dipole in my attic. I used balance and traps manufactured by a company called Unadilla, which is no longer in business. This was a work in progress, which lasted for six years. This is the ballon. I used 12 gauge solid copper wire for the antenna. In the interest of total disclosure, I have no relationship whatsoever with Joel Knobloch, W3RFC, or the RF connection. I get all my antenna components and cables from the RF connection in Gaithersburg, Maryland. They have a great selection, great prices, and Joel is a wealth of information about anything having to do with the antennas. This is one of the 20 meter traps. This is a schematic diagram of my antenna. I got as far as 30 meters and then I ran out of room. My Dentron antenna tuner could still get a one-to-one -one standing wave ratio on 40 meters, but I wasn't willing to dissipate radio frequency energy as heat anymore. I wanted an antenna that was resonant in the CW portion of the 40 meter band. I consulted the ARRL antenna book, updated 14th edition, published in 1984. It has some advice on what to do if a dipole won't fit into the available space. Remember that the center of the dipole carries the most current and therefore does most of the radiating. This part should be as high and as unfolded as possible. Because the dipole ends radiate less energy than the center, their orientation is not very important. They do carry a maximum voltage nevertheless, so care should be taken to position the ends far enough away from other conductors to avoid arcing. I followed their advice. I hung 18 inch copper wires from the ends of each of the 30 meter traps. I actually needed six feet of wire for resonance in the CW portion of the 40 meter band but I wanted to keep the ends far away from everything else. And that meant I couldn't use more than 18 inches. This is called a bent dipole or drooping dipole. The resonant frequency on 40 meters was now 8,900 kilohertz. I went back to the ARRL antenna book which explains how to electrically lengthen a dipole by adding capacitance to the ends of the dipole. This technique is called capacitance loading and the capacitance at the end of the dipole is referred to as a capacitance hat. I'm not talking about capacitance like this. I'm talking about capacitance like this, self-capacitance which is the ability of an isolated conductor in free space to store charge. Because the charge on a conductor resides on the outer surface, the conductor doesn't have to be solid. It can be hollow. The ARRL antenna book has this graph, which tells me that I'm gonna get the most bang for my buck from a cylinder. Where am I going to find a hollow conductor in the shape of a cylinder? 
for some reason that I'm not aware of, beverage containers are aluminum. Aluminum is an okay conductor at radio frequencies, is light and doesn't rust. Food containers are steel. Steel is a poor conductor at radio frequencies, is heavy and will rust. This was my first capacitance hat. It's a 12 ounce beverage container. I hung one of these from each of the 30 meter traps. Now the antenna was resonant at 8420 kilohertz. So I looked around for a larger beverage container. This is a capacitance hat with a 25.4 ounce beverage container. I hung one of these from each of the 30 meter traps. Now the antenna was resonant at 7940 kilohertz. I needed a larger beverage container. I couldn't find one. Then I remembered that capacitors in parallel add. So I placed two 25.4 ounce beverage containers in parallel. I hung one of these from each of the 30 meter traps. This is one of the capacitance hats hanging from the 30 meter trap in my attic. I didn't realize the irony of the situation until I was putting this presentation together. I was trying to make a QSO with Australia using a dipole loaded with Australian beer cans. I wouldn't try doing this on an outside antenna. Even the slightest breeze would get this thing moving. And when it was moving, the standing wave ratio would fluctuate wildly and that would cause problems. Now the antenna was resonant at 6980 kilohertz. I trimmed a half inch from the vertical wire. Now the antenna was resonant at 7030 kilohertz. That was not what I intended to do. That's just what I ended up with after I was finished trimming. So let's take a look at the standing wave ratio of the antenna. This is not a good antenna. The standing wave ratio SWR bandwidth is terrible. Like a lot of things in life, there are trade-offs. When you electrically lengthen an antenna, you reduce the SWR bandwidth. This is the trade-off I made to fit a 66-foot antenna into 33 feet of space. I'm a CW operator, so let's look at the CW portion of the band. The standing wave ratio is two to one or less in the CW portion of the 40 meter band. This is acceptable. It's a lot better than 16 to one. I replaced the 20 year old Belden 9913 coax with LMR 400 coax. I made one change to the equipment lineup. I replaced the MFJ electronic keyer with a memory keyer. The memory keyer can be pre-programmed with things like my call, the contest exchange, and individual elements of the contest exchange. All I have to do is push the correct button and it sends whatever is pre-programmed in that memory position. I learned the hard way that when I'm tired or excited or both, my CW sending skill deteriorates. I didn't want to blow a contact because I couldn't send CW properly. While all the antenna work was going on, I was searching for an Australian station, preferably a contest superstation with a world-class operator at the controls. Where do you find a station like that? In a contest. In February, 
the third full weekend is the ARRL International DXCW contest. In May, the last full weekend is the CQ Worked All Prefixes CW contest. In October, the second full weekend is the Oceana DXCW contest. In November, the last full weekend is the CQ Worldwide DXCW contest. Now I knew the dates of the contests. How am I going to figure out the time of day and the frequency? Sunset in Australia occurs two to three hours before sunrise in Maryland. During this time period, Australia and Maryland and the path between them are in total darkness. 40 meters is a nighttime band. So listen on 40 meters during this time. Sunrise in Australia occurs two to three hours before sunset in Maryland. During this time period, Australia and Maryland and the path between them are in total daylight. 20 meters and 15 meters are daytime bands. So listen on 20 meters and 15 meters during this time. Now I know the dates, the times, and the frequencies. During these contests, I would wake up a few hours before sunrise and search for Australian stations on 40 meters. I also searched for Australian stations in the afternoon on 20 meters and 15 meters during these contests. I never heard an Australian station on 20 meters or 15 meters during the past six years. Sometimes I heard an Australian station on 40 meters. They were always weak. I kept pushing the button on my memory keyer, but they never heard me. While I was searching for an Australian station, I was also working on DX Century Club QRP. I worked several stations that I needed, so my time wasn't completely unproductive. February 20th, 2021 was the ARRL International DX Contest CW. I started listening on 40 meters at 0600 UTC, which is 1 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. This was actually a few hours before sunset in Australia. I was hoping to work a New Zealand station, which I needed for DX Century Club QRP. At 0611 UTC, which is 111 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, I worked ZM4T in New Zealand on 7020 kilohertz on QRP. At 0717 UTC, which is 217 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, I worked CT1 GFK in Portugal on 7037 kilohertz on QRP. Around 0745 UTC, which is 245 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, I heard VK2IA on 7030 kilohertz. The World Radio Sport Team Championship ranks him as the number one contest operator in Australia. If we look at his qrz.com page, we see that he is also an accomplished de-expeditioner. He is definitely a world-class operator. In the ARRL International DX contest, the DX station exchange includes the output power. VK2IA was using 120 watts and he was very loud, louder than any other Australian station that I had heard during the past six years. I started thinking that if he was this loud with 120 watts, 
he might actually be able to hear my five watts. I called him. One of the hallmarks of a world-class operator is that once he or she decides that they're going to work a particular station, they stay at it until they have worked that station. It didn't hurt that things were very slow. So VK2IA wasn't missing out on other QSOs trying to work me. VK2IA tried, but he couldn't pull my call sign through. I frantically pushed the button on my memory keyer. VK2IA tried again, but he still couldn't pull my call sign through. I frantically pushed the button on my memory keyer. VK2IA kept trying. I kept frantically pushing the button on my memory keyer. After a few minutes of this, I felt guilty about taking up his time, so I broke off. I knew that it was getting darker in Australia, and I was hoping that 40 meter propagation would improve. I was taking a big chance. There was no guarantee that VK2IA would still be there later. I tuned through 40 meters looking for other stations that I needed. VK2IA kept calling on 7030 kilohertz. I called VK2IA again at 0830 UTC, which is 3.30 AM Eastern Standard Time. The same thing happened as my previous attempt. I called VK2IA again at 0908 UTC, which is 4.08 AM Eastern Standard Time. He replied with my call sign and his contest exchange. The first element of his contest exchange was my signal report, which was going to be 599 no matter what. He was using cut numbers N for nine. The second element of his contest exchange was his output power. He sent A2T. A is a cut number for one, two, T is a cut number for zero. One, two, zero. I sent my contest exchange, which was his signal report and my state. This is why I used a memory keyer. He sent TU, which is the telegraphic code for thank you, to confirm the contact. Six years of effort two-way communications over a distance of 9,765 miles using less energy than an LED light bulb. This is my log. You can see that I worked ZM4T at 0611 UTC, which is 111 AM Eastern Standard Time. CT1 GFK at 0717 UTC, which is 217 AM Eastern Standard Time, and VK2IA at 0908 UTC, which is 408 AM Eastern Standard Time. Notice VK2IA's frequency. 7030 kilohertz is where my antenna was resonant in the 40 meter band. That's the frequency where the antenna radiates the most power. I didn't intend for the, res the antenna to be resonant at 7030 kilohertz. That's just where it ended up after I trimmed it. There's a saying in the QRP community, power is no substitute for skill. That's true, but a lot of that skill was with the operator on the other end of the QSO. I'm grateful that these world-class contest operators made the effort to pull my QRP signal through. I try to pay it forward. If I hear a station calling CQ very slowly, 
I'll slow down and answer him. If I hear a weak station calling CQ, I'll answer him. I listen on the QRP calling frequencies, the SOTA calling frequencies, and the IOTA calling frequencies. And if someone is calling CQ and needs a QSO, I'll answer them. This is the front side of VK2IA's QSL card. This is the reverse side of VK2IA's QSL card. Some things in life come about through planning and preparation. This QSO with Australia was the result of planning and preparation with a lot of help from the operator at the other end and a lot of luck. Some things in life we just stumble into. There is no planning and preparation. It's entirely luck. And that's the story of the next QSO I'm gonna tell you about. We all went through a contentious and divisive presidential election in 2020. How many of us who were around in the year 2000 remember what that presidential election was like? It was one of the closest presidential elections in United States history. The Supreme Court of the United States intervened. The Supreme Court didn't actually declare who the winner was, but the Supreme Court decisions determine the outcome of the election. We didn't know who won the election until December 19th of 2000. The losing candidate received the majority of the popular vote. Inauguration day was Thursday, January 20th, 2001. That night, I grabbed an 807 and headed up to the shack. I had known for my entire amateur career that hams referred to a bottle of beer as an 807, but the only beer bottles I had ever seen were the long neck variety, and I never understood how this had anything to do with an 807. A few years ago, Coors started using retro bottles. Well, maybe. The last time I had been in the shack was two days earlier. I had been using the 10 Tech 1320 QRP rig to work 20 meter CW. Back then, I still had the Barker and Williamson antenna, which was very good on 20 meters. I had brand new Belden 9913 coax. The Dentron antenna tuner was tuned for the CW portion of 20 meters. The 10 Tech 1320 QR pig was ready to go. I was too tired to change anything. So I turned the power supply on and started trolling 20 meters. When I got to 14024 kilohertz, I heard this. This was a Russian station. This was in 2001 at the peak of a very good solar cycle. Russian stations were very common. A QSO with a Russian station consisted of 5NN, TU, and that was it. If the Argosy had been hooked up, I probably wouldn't have taken the time to answer him. But I was running QRP, and it might be a little bit of a challenge, so I called him. He answered me. He didn't send 5NN, TU. He wanted a rag chew. He told me my RST was 569, his name was Nick, and he started to tell me his QTH. When I'm communicating with another ham, I use conversational CW. I don't copy every character the other operator sends. I listen to the CW just like I listen to someone who's speaking. I was listening as he sent his QTH and I couldn't believe what I was hearing. So I picked up a pencil and started copying the characters he was sending. This is what I copied. South Pole Station, Antarctica.
I replied to him and told him his RST was 579. My name was John and my QTH was Maryland. He wanted to rag you. So we went back and forth for about 20 minutes. When he signed off, the ensuing pileup nearly ruptured my eardrums. Two-way communications over a distance of 8,908 miles using less energy than an LED light bulb with a radio that I had built myself. This is the front side of Nick's QSL card. It has an aerial view of Amundsen Scott South Pole Station. In the lower right, you can see the locations of the geographic South Pole in 1977, 1999, and January 2001. The inset on the lower left shows Nick at the geographic South Pole holding on to the Earth's axis. The world is literally revolving around him. This is the reverse side of Nick's QSL card. That's my call sign in Nick's handwriting. You can see Nick was using a six element Yagi Uda antenna, which explains how he was able to copy my four watts. That's a very directional antenna. It must have been pointing in my direction or he never would have heard me. This is my thousand mile per watt achievement certificate. That's the end of my story. Back to you, Alex. Hold on here. Ah, <laughs> here we go. Ah, can you see me? Thank you, John. That was awesome. I, you know, I was taking so many notes. So what a great presentation and a great you have so much great information for people that 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 want to uh, do some of the things you have is very instructional, very informative and very enjoyable. Thank you so much. Any questions from our uh, members come now, please. I have a question. Uh, John, why were you so concerned about uh, using stealth antennas? Was this just a uh, a personal view or you felt that perhaps if your neighbors didn't know that you were a ham that uh, uh, there'd be less issues or, or exactly what was your line of thinking? You know, Mark, to tell you the truth, it was just a phase I was going through. I, I didn't care about the neighbors. Um, I could have put the antenna up in the trees. I had plenty of trees, no power lines, no homeowners association, no deed restrictions. It was entirely a phase that I was going through. So we have a question from Fred, K3CSX. Yeah, hey, um, John, when you um, talked about the antenna that you built, your stealth antenna, how, how long did you say that was? For some reason, I thought I heard you say 18 inches. I, I'm, I'm guessing no, it was 18 inches. No, um, no, actually, let me, uh, let me go back and I'll show you. Um, I was trying to add up the, the length. I'll show the you the schematic diagram of it. Okay. Yeah, that. Okay. Um, the way a uh, trap dipole works is uh, I have a bow in the center, and then the 10 meter traps are here. The 10 meter traps are parallel resonant circuits at 10 meters, which is a very high impedance. So if you put 10 meter radio frequency energy into this here, 
it can travel out to the 10 meter trap and it can't go any further. So each leg of the dipole between the ballon and the 10 meter trap is eight feet, four inches. That's a full size 10 meter antenna. Okay. okay. Now the 15 meter trap is a parallel resonance circuit with a very high impedance at 15 meters. So 15 meter energy can't get past the trap. So if you put 15 meter radio frequency energy in here, it can travel through here. The 10 meter trap appears to be an inductance, which electrically lengthens the antenna. And then there's an additional one foot, 10 inches of wire before it gets to 15 meters. If uh, okay. you put 20 meter radio frequency energy into here, the 20 meter trap is a parallel resonant circuit with a very high impedance at 20 meters. So the 20 meter energy goes into the ballon through the leg of the dipole. The 10 meter trap appears to be an inductance which electrically lengthens the antenna. There's an additional one foot, 10 inches of wire. It comes to the 15 meter trap, which appears to be a inductance, which electrically lengthens the antenna. And then you have three foot, six inches of wire. It comes to the 20 meter trap, high impedance, can't travel any further. So this appears to be a full size dipole at 20 meters. And you get the picture, right, Fred? Yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay. Uh, Tom, uh, W3TDH, you have a question? Thank you. Um, did you ever consider using like uh, aluminum duct or anything like that to get your cylinder? I was just curious. Uh, I considered using a lot of things and uh, the beverage container was close at hand and that was the first thing I came up with. So I stuck with the beverage container. Okay, and the second question, um, you, you already answered for uh, Mark, so thank you very much. I really appreciate your presentation, it's inspiring. Oh, no, you're back welcome, to, Tom. Back to me. Uh, okay. I have a question. Actually, I have a comment and a question. Uh, let me say this. If you've never done QRP and you do it for the first time and you get success, you're hooked. It's addictive, totally addictive. Um, yeah. And the FCC, I heard Riley Hollingsworth give a presentation at Dayton. He was working for the FCC. He said, boy, do I love the uh, QRP operators, my favorite people on ham radio. And I said, all right. Now, my question is, where, where is the uh, end of the antenna secured to the actual beverage? Do you bring it through where you, uh, uh, you consume the beer you, to the center or the bottom or to something? Yeah, let, let, me, uh, let me show you. Uh, I'll show you the schematic diagram first, and then I'll show you the photograph. Um, this is the schematic diagram. So the antenna goes out, there's a 30 meter trap and the capacitance hat or the beverage container or the beer can is hanging off the 30 meter trap. And let me show you a photograph of that. What you see here is this is the 12 gauge solid copper wire comes out to the 30 meter trap. And then the capacitance hat, which consists of a vertical wire, a horizontal wire, two capacitances in parallel, that's hanging off the end of the 30 meter trap. Right. Now my question is, aluminum doesn't solder well to copper and vice versa. So is it, it must be a physical connection, you know, you must crimp it or something. Oh, I, I screwed it. I, I oh, uh, okay. what I did was I um, did a tiny hole in the bottom of the beverage container. I took a piece of wire, made a U-shaped hook in it, put that on top of the bottom, and then I took a sheet metal screw and oh. screwed that into the beverage container. That's mm -hmm. how I attached it. Very good. Okay. All right. Any more questions for John? 
All right. Well, again, thank you so much for taking time to do this really terrific presentation. Very informative. Um, really great. So um, if there are no more questions. Yeah. Um, Actually, I have one more question. Yeah. John, I noticed um, you use a, a, a program keyer. Have you considered using a keyboard? To generate CW? Yeah. Um, the problem is, though, if I'm tired or excited or both, my typing skills aren't necessarily that good. If I use the memory keyer, I just got to push one button and yeah. that's it. Right. Okay. Very good. Thank you.